Okay, so now Mustafa, uh, the things on you. Uh, you give after you introduce the speaker, I'll just play the video. Okay. Um, so shall we start or wait a few minutes? Because we still. Yeah, we still have a couple of minutes. I think we can. Yeah, maybe if somebody wait will. Okay. Yeah. I'm not able to share again. It says sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. Uh, you cannot share the slide deck, you mean? Okay, now it's full screen actually. Okay, I think we can start. Hello everyone, welcome to our session. Uh, let me introduce myself first and then we can continue with, uh, we, today we have five papers. Um, my name is Mustafa Kani. Uh, I'm a research staff member at uh, IBM TJ Watson Research Center. Um, I have been working at uh, IBM Research uh, in the last couple of 10 years. Uh, I mostly work on uh, Watson team and Watson technologies, uh, focusing on NLP and AI uh, problems, as well as some uh, graph mining and graph analytics problems. Um, today, our session is on uh, graph analytics mostly, and uh, we have these five papers. The first uh, paper is uh, efficient team formation in social networks based on constrained pattern graph. Uh, the paper number 513 and uh, I believe Yuko is presenting the slides today. Harsha, we can play it I think. Hello everyone. It's my pleasure to give a presentation here. My name is Yuko. I come from Northeastern University of China. The topic of my presentation is efficient team formation in social networks based on constrained pattern graph. The content of my presentation is divided into five parts. First, I will introduce the research background. Team formation in social networks is essential for an organization or institute's variability. However, most existing works tend to rely on a set of skills and only considers the size of teams, diameter, or the total communication cost among members. Usually, people with different skills in a team have different degrees of communication. 
Let's see an example. Suppose a project needs six types of people, including project manager, software engineer, database developer, test engineer, data analyst, and secretary. We can represent the task requirement as a constraint pattern graph called CPZ. Each edge in the CPZ is labeled with a value, indicating the communication cost of the two nodes in social networks should be no longer than the value. For example, a PM needs to be associated with a SE within the distance of two. We will map the CPZ to the social network to find a team that satisfies the task requirement. Although some subgraph isomorphism supports matching for CPZ, it aims to return the entire matching subgraphs and incurs an NP complete problem. For team formation, people are more interested in finding nodes rather than the entire subgraphs. Let's see another example. Suppose there are two matching orders. For the first one, there are M partial mappings, which have to be combined with N plus one partial mappings. So we have to consider M times N plus one cancel combination, most of which are false positive. However, we can know early the N partial mappings don't satisfy the request. They can be eliminated. At this time, it only leads to N plus one plus M partial mappings. So the uniqueness of team formation problem leaves much room for improvements. In this paper, we make the following contributions. First, a CPC preprocessing method is proposed to normalize the CPC and represent it as a call CPC in order to establish the basis for efficient matching. Second, a communication cost index is designed to speed up the matching between the CPC and the social networks. Third, based on the call CPC and the constructed CCI, a node matching algorithm is proposed to determine the matching order of nodes in the CPZ. Fourth, the incremental maintenance strategies are proposed for the changes of social networks. Finally, the intensive experimental studies based upon two real-world social networks are conducted. We adopt the idea of divide and conquer. First, divide the CPZ into several parts, and then match them one by one to reduce the matching cost. We propose a CPZ preprocessing method. Step one is CPZ normalization. The goal is to remove all the redundant edges from the CPZ. For example, there are two edges removed from the CPZ. Second, generate the Q's MST. Then we can determine the non-tree edges. Here, the non-tree edges mean the edges in Q, but not appearing in Q's MST. Third, determine the call path QC and the site of non call path QN. Here, the minimal connected subgraph that contains all the non tree edges is determined as QC. For example, there are one call path and two non call paths. Finally, determine the call node U call in VC. The node in QC with fewer matching nodes in data graph, and closer communication with other nodes will be selected as a U-call. 
Now let's see how to determine the matching order of nodes in the CPD. First, a CCI is constructed to compactly encode all possible embeddings of Q in G. Suppose there are two nodes in Q. Their matching nodes are V1, V2, and V3, V4, V5, respectively. Then there will be two index nodes in CCI. The node set of E1 includes V1 and V2. The node set of E2 includes V3 and V4. Only three paths satisfy the communication constraints. They are stored in the edge set of E2. Then, how to construct a CCI? First, generate the root node you call of the CCI. Step two is top-down checking based on the rule R1. Here, the rule R1 reveals that for any node in Chell's node set, at least there exists one node in parent's node set, where the communication cost between them can satisfy the requirement. Step three is bottom-up refining based on the rule R2. Here, the rule R2 is used to guarantee that for any node in parent node set, at least there exists one node in child's node set correspondingly. Based on the constructed CCI, we can determine the matching order of nodes. We propose three heuristic matching rules. The first one is call first matching rule. The nodes in QC should be matched before the nodes in QN. Here, we use an existing cost model to estimate the matching cost based on a certain matching order of nodes. The cost is relevant to the number of embeddings produced currently the number of candidates, and the number of entry edges. For example, suppose this is the CCI. Then we can compare the matching cost under two matching orders. The latter one matches the nodes in the call part first, and it's better than the former. The second rule is pruning power first matching rule. Given a set of root to leave paths sharing the root node in the call part of the CCI, the path with the strongest proning power should be matched first. Here, the proning power is relevant to the search breadth. The satisfaction rates derived from nantry edges and the number of nantry edges. For example, there are three candidate paths. We calculate their proning power respectively and select one with the strongest value to be matched first. The third rule is search breadth first matching rule, given a set of QN. The non call part with less search breadth should be matched first. Based on the above rules, we propose a CCI-based node matching algorithm. First, according to the call first and the proning power first matching rules, generate the matching order of nodes in QC. Second, according to the search breadth first matching rule, generate the matching order of nodes in QN site. Now let's see our experimental results. We use two real world social graphs, ego, Facebook, and email, Aaron. First, we evaluate the quality of the teams produced by the following different algorithms. They consider different factors, such as label, diameter, the sum distance, and the MST distance. Our method is CPG-based team formation, called CPGTF. As shown in this figure, the diameter, sum distance, 
MSG distance of the teams found by our method are comparable to that of others. The total communication cost of the teams found by our method is smaller than all the others. The results verify the effectiveness of our method. For the performance evaluation of node matching, we evaluate and compare different matching methods. Here, CCM match is our method. The query time of our method is less than that of other methods in both of the two data sets. Here, baseline one ignores the matching cost based on a matching order of nodes. Baseline two focuses on the data graph that consists of multiple smaller subgraphs. All the nodes in the data graph need to be indexed. When the size of data graph increases, the cost of node matching increases sharply. This is the result of performance evaluation for CCI construction. Now let's conclude. We propose a CPC preprocessing method and design an index structure that is CCI, to speed up the matching between the CPG and the data graph. We propose a CCI-based node matching algorithm to minimize the total number of intermediate results. Some incremental maintenance strategies are proposed. The experiments demonstrate the effectiveness and the efficiency of our proposed method. In the future, we will work on multi-objective team formation methods and incremental maintenance strategies for changes of a CPD. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, very good talk. Uh, that looks like there's a question, uh, which is pasted to Zoom chat window uh, from Ning Ning Sui. Um, the question is, previous works such as subgraph isomorphism have also addressed the pattern graph matching problem. Could you tell the difference from them? Intuitively using the MST only could already remove redundant edges. Why are both CPG normalization and MST general gener generation needed? Uh, Professor Yuko, are you there? Uh, are you on mute? Okay, I think uh, she either has an audio problem or Anyway Oh, she writes, can you hear me? But we cannot hear you. Let's Okay, actually you're unmuted. You might have an audio issue. Maybe you can reply over the... You, you may reply over the Zoom uh, window maybe. Harsha, can you hear me? Uh, hello, I, I I can hear. I can hear. Uh, you, Ixin, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can hear. Uh, do, 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 do I need to give a, a simple description about our paper? Uh, one second, please. Uh, so, okay. Since uh, we cannot fix the audio problem with uh, you, call, I think we can continue with the second paper. Um, the second paper's title is Effective and Efficient Trust Computation Over Large Heterogeneous Information Networks. Uh, number Paper number 550. Uh, the, uh, the presenter is Yixing Yang uh, from University of uh, University New South of Wales. UN, UNSW, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I believe in the video you already introduced yourself, right? So I think we can start playing the video. Okay, okay, yeah, that's good. And yeah, and if there's any question after the session, after the presentation, people, wanna, people can ask you. Yeah. Let's start. 
Hi everyone, I'm Yi Xing Yang. I'm from the University of New South Wales, and I'm very happy to present our paper, Effective and Efficient Trust Computation Over Large Heterogeneous Information Networks. First, let's see what is heterogeneous information networks. Please notice that in this presentation, we always use HIN to denote heterogeneous information networks. In traditional homogeneous networks, all the vertices have the same tab and all the edges have the same tab. Like in Facebook friendship network, each vertex represents a person while each edge represents a friendship relationship. Well, heterogeneous information networks are always used for modeling networks with multiple typed objects and multiple typed links, such as bibliographic networks, social media networks, and knowledge networks. For example, this one is a simple DBLP network, which contains four object types, author, paper, venue, and topic. And there are three different edge types. Author read papers, paper has topics, and venue published papers. Given an HIN, it is necessary to provide its schema level description or network schema. This one is the network schema for DBLP network, which describes the meta structure of the network. Next, let's see what is trust. In classic definition, given a homogeneous network and the integer k, the k trust is the largest subgraph such that each edge is contained in at least the k minus two triangles. And it's always used for cohesive subgraphs money. Let's see an example. This one is the initial graph. This one is the three trusts in the initial graph. And this one is the four trusts in the initial graph. So why we focus on trust model? There are many advantages of trust model, but the biggest one is the good balance between cohesiveness and the computational complexity. On the one hand, vertices are densely connected via triangles in the K-trust. On the other hand, it doesn't take too much time to compute a K-trust. Now let's turn to related works. There are two groups of related works. One is for trust computation, and the other is for cohesive subgraph computation over HIM. For trust computation, there are papers about trust decomposition, trust-based community search, and IO-efficient trust computation. For cohesive subgraph computation over HIM, there are papers about k-call and click computation over HIM. After introducing the basic concepts, let's see how to formulate a trust over an HIN. The first question is, what is a trust over HIN? In this paper, we aim to get a set of vertices with the same type, and meanwhile, they are densely connected via triangle-based cohesiveness. There are two key challenges for formulating such a trust. The first one is how to connect two vertices with the same type. Please notice that vertices with the same type may not be directly connected. The second one is how to connect three vertices to form a triangle. For solving the first challenge, we adopt the metapath for solving the second challenge. We introduce the concept of meta triangle, and I will introduce these concepts later. Now, let's turn to problem formulation. The first concept is metapath. A metapath is a path of a network schema. It's a sequence of relationships between two vertex tabs. In this paper, we focus on symmetric metapath. Let's say an example. This one is a DBLP network schema. This one, APA, is a metapath of a DBLP network, which describes the co-author relationship. And this one, APTPA, is another metapath of a DBLP network. The next concept is p-pair. Given a metapath p, a p-pair is a pair of two vertices connected by an instance of metapath p. For example, in this example, we have a simple HIN which contains six authors, five papers, one topic, and one venue. 
And we can see that in this example, A1 and A2 can form a P pair when P is APA. After introducing the concept of P pair, let's turn to the concept of P graph. Given the metapath P, a P graph is a homogeneous graph. The vertex set is the set of vertices with the n type of P, and the edges set is a set of P pairs. In other words, each edge denotes a P pair. Let's see an example. This one is a P graph of the simple HIN, and we can see that each P pair is denoted by an edge in this P graph. After introducing the basic concepts, let's see how do we define triangles in HINs. The first type of triangle is called basic triangle or B triangle. Given a metapath P, we say that three vertices can form a B triangle if each pair among them is connected by an instance of P. Let's see this example. In this example, we can see that A4, A5, and A6 can form a B triangle regarding metapath APA. However, although the definition of B triangle is very simple, it may lead to weak cohesiveness. Let's see this example again. In this example, consider if we remove only one vertex P5, then A4, A5, and A6 will be disconnected with each other. That means they are not so cohesively connected. So for improving the cohesiveness, we introduce another type of triangle called circle triangle or C triangle. Given a metapath P, we see that three vertices can form a C triangle regarding the metapath if each pair is connected by an instance of P and these three paths connecting them can form a circle. Let's see this example. In this example, we can see that A2, A3, and A4 can form a circle triangle because there are three path instances connecting them and these paths can form a circle. Please note that a C triangle is always a B triangle. After introducing the definition of triangles, let's see how do we define supports for a BP pair in the HIM. Similar to definition of triangles, there are two types of support. B support is the number of B triangles containing the P pair, and C support is the number of C triangles containing the P pair. After introducing definition of triangles over HINs, let's see how do we define trust over HINs. The first one is KPB trust, or KB trust when there is no ambiguity. It's based on B triangle, and it's the largest set of P pairs such that each P pair has a B support of K minus two or more. Similarly, we have KPC trust, or KC trust, which is based on C triangle. It's the largest set of P pairs such that each P pair has a C support of K minus two or more. Let's see this example. In this example, we have metapath APA, and this one is the three B truss for the simple HIN, and this one is the three C truss for the simple HIN. Please notice that this KC truss is contained by the KB truss. Now, let's talk about how to compute the truss over HIN. Let's start from B truss. For computing the B truss, a straightforward algorithm is to obtain the P graph first and then recursively remove P pairs with B support less than K minus two in the P graph. However, this algorithm is not so efficient. So why it is so inefficient? We found that P graph are always extremely dense. For example, in the DBLP network, the average degree of authors is 2.86. But in the P graph, when P is APTPA, the average degree of authors is over 162. To achieve efficiency, we propose a faster B trust algorithm. As the P graph are always very dense, we propose some pruning techniques for reducing the computation cost of B support for some P pairs. The first one can help skip the computation of some P pairs in the KB trust. 
where the second one can help skip the computation of some p pairs out of the KB trunks. And the details for these techniques can be found in our paper. Now let's turn to KC trust computation. There are some key challenges for computing the KC trust. The first one is the KC trust cannot be directly computed on P graph. The second one is how to efficiently verify C triangles in HINs. The last one is given a C triangle verification algorithm, how to efficiently use it. First, let's talk about how to efficiently verify C triangles. In this work, we first studied C triangle verification algorithm on short metapath with lens 2. We studied two approaches to verify whether three vertices can form a C triangle. The first one is 1D verify, which searches the C triangle in one direction. The second one is Betty verify, which searches the C triangle bidirectionally. And we found that Betty verify is more efficient than 1D verify. So we generalize Betty verify for longer metapaths. After introducing the C triangle verification algorithm, let's turn to C trust computation. Firstly, we introduce a straightforward algorithm for computing C trust. There are three main steps. First, it enumerates all the C triangles and collects them in a set. Second, it computes the C support for each P pair. Finally, it recursively removes those P pairs whose C support are less than K minus 2. However, enumerating all the C triangles is very time consuming. So, can we avoid enumerating all the C triangles? Following the intuition to avoid enumerating all the C triangles, we propose a progressive C trust computation algorithm, which is called proxy trust. It progressively finds more C triangles for each P pair, and the main steps are listed here. At start, for each P pair, it finds up to K minus 2 C triangles containing it. Next, it removes P pairs containing less than K minus 2 C triangles. Finally, it repeats the first two steps until the KC trust is obtained. After introducing the algorithms, let's see the experiments. This slide gives the information of datasets and parameter settings in our experiments. The first three datasets are with simple schemas, while the rest two datasets are with rich schemas. Now, let's see the effectiveness evaluation. First, we studied the trust size distributions, and the results are presented here. We can see that the KC trust is always larger than the KB trust. Next, we did a case study of community search over DBLP network. We extend the idea of trust-based community search of homogeneous graphs, and we perform a community query on vertex Zhuhan. Here, the K is set as 5, and we use Metapath APA. The results are shown here. We can find the B-trust-based community contains two groups of researchers, while the C-trust-based community forms a seven-clique, which indicates the strong collaboration of authors in the community. Next, let's see the efficiency evaluation. For KB trust, we can observe that fast B trust runs consistently faster than basic B trust, because fast B trust skips computation for many P pairs. For KC trust, we can observe that proxy trust runs consistently faster than PUC trust, because proxy trust doesn't enumerate all the C triangles. Finally, let's conclude this work. In this work, we propose two trust models over HINs, and we develop efficient algorithms. And we also perform extensive experimental studies. In the future, we will develop efficient distributed algorithms. And we also want to use our trust models in more real applications. If you have any questions, please contact me via this email address.
Okay. Uh, very nice talk. Thanks, Ying Xing. Uh, is there any question for Ying Xing for this talk? He is available online to answer if there's any question. Yeah. Are there any questions? Okay, so the third paper is uh, index-free approach with theoretical guarantee for efficient random walk with uh, restart query. Uh, the paper number 559. Um, the author, Dan Dan Lin, is uh, a PhD candidate from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And I guess she's also online right now. If there's any question after the presentation, you can ask your questions. Okay, I think we can start. Hi everyone, my name is Dan Dan Ning, a PhD candidate from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Today, I'm going to present our paper, Index Re Approach with Theoretical Guarantee for Efficient Random Work with Restart Query. This is a joint work with my supervisor, Raymond Wong. Here is the outline of my talk. Now, let's start with the introduction. Assume that we have a directed graph GVE, where V is the set of nodes and E is the set of edges. Then what we restart will measure the similarity score between two nodes in the graph. Here, similarity score is called RWR score. Suppose that there is a graph, and given a source node S in the graph and a termination probability alpha, random work with restart will simulate a random work starting from the source node S such that at each step he has two options. The first option is with alpha probability he will stop at the current node. And the second option is with one minus alpha probability he will move to an neighbor of the current node. Take this graph for example. S is the source node with one minus R probability moves to node V. And at node V with one minus R probability moves to node T. And node T with R probability, it decided to terminate. A random work from the source node is simulated. With such a random work, for any node T in the graph, the RWR score per ST of node T with respect to the source node is defined to be the probability that a random work starting from S terminates at the node T. Random work with restart has many applications, such as personalized web search in Google, brand recommendation in Twitter, or detect the overlapping communities in a graph. In this paper, we focus on the single source query, in which case it will return the RWR score of all nodes in the graph with respect to the so a given source node S. However, the exact solution for the single source query is very time consuming. It takes big O n power 2.373, where n is the number of nodes in the graph. So there are many approximate methods proposed to answer the single source query. However, for some work, it's unclear whether they could guarantee the, the accuracy of the approximate results. And some work are index oriented. All of them suffer from huge pre-processing time and bulky space size. Moreover, they cannot effectively handle the dynamic graphs. Finally, all the existing index-free methods take a long time to return results. In our paper, we consider three requirements for evaluating a miser for single source. The first one is index-free. We think it should have no index structure. The second one is the score returned by this method should have the upper bounds. And the third one is high efficiency. It should be faster to compute the scores. However, none of the existing method can satisfy these three requirements in the meantime. In our paper for the upper bound requirements, we focus on approximate single source query. Given a graph G and a source node S in this graph and relative error epsilon for each node T in this graph, we return an estimation high per ST of its RWR score per ST. We will guarantee that the relative error between the estimated score and the exact score is at most epsilon. 
our paper has three contributions. We propose an index free algorithm satisfying the three requirements as stated before. Besides, our method reset is faster than all the existing methods by up to four times in terms of query time. Next, the result returned by our method achieves higher accuracy than all the existing methods by up to six orders of magnitude. Next, we introduce one existing technique called forward search. Forward search is the most popular and the basic technique for answering a single source query. In this graph, for example, we, we know for the source not as he has phone our neighbors. Think about a question. Now, if a unit information is propagated from not as where a random work, how much information will be propagated to not T in expectation? Forward search thinks that it will reserve a portion of the information to itself because a random word will terminate at itself with output bit. And for each of our neighbor, the, the amount of information they will receive is one minus alpha divided by four because a random work will select one of four our neighbors with one minus alpha probability. In random work, he thinks that the amount of information that propagated to S itself it cannot be propagated anymore. It's called reserve. And the amount of information that pushes to S's our neighbor is for further propagation. So it's called less true. The basic idea of for search is to perform many push operations by propagating information from the source node to all the nodes in the graph. Specifically, for each node V in the graph, it will compute two values. The first value is reserved, pi FSV. It's the amount of information that has been propagated to V from the source node, which cannot be propagated anymore. And the other is the residue, RFSV. It's the amount of information temporarily held by no V and for further propagation. Based on forward search, we propose a method called reset. It has two intuition. One is residual accumulation, which will avoid the duplicate push operations. His basic idea is to accumulate the residue of a node to a large value. So we can perform one push operation by using this accumulative residue. The other is cutting loop. It will reduce the number of push operations triggered by the source node. His basic idea is to do push operation at the source node only once. Now let's go for the last year accumulation. We think for search is not efficient because it performs many redundant push operations. To explain this, we use the graph here and the node S is the source node here. The green number indicates the reserve and the blue number indicates the residue. We assume the termination probability is 0 0.2. According to the forward search, firstly, we do push operation at S. It will increase the reserve of S itself and propagating the remaining information to his own neighbors, V1 and V2. So the ratio of V1 and V2 becomes 0 0.4. Next, it will do a push operation at V1 it will increase the result V1 and the propagation of remaining information to V3. Now, we reserve the push operation here as the rough hand set is the first push operation at V1. Next, it will do a push operation at V2 and it will pro propagate a portion of information to V1. We could see that the ratio of V1 is increasing from zero. So we need to do another push operation at V1 and the propagating information to V3. We could see that the second push operation at V1 is the same as the first push. It means that we do the duplicate operations. How to deal with this problem? To avoid the duplicate push operations, our ratio accumulation accumulates the ratio of the node to a larger value. Take the previous graph for example. In this case, we let the ratio of V1 be accumulated until its ratio cannot be increased. So we firstly do a push operation at node S, and next we do a push operation at V2 because V1 could not do the push operation. So we're propagating a part of the information from V2 to V1 
and the last rule of v1 is increased. Next, we could do a push operation at v1 and propagating the results to v3. From this, we could see that the results are the same as before, but we only do one push operation at v1 because the residual accumulation at v1. Now let's go for the cutting loop. We think a uh, forward search has a looping at the source node. To expand this, we use this kind of graph. And here S is the source node, and the initial residue to the S is one. So according to the forward search, you will do the following push operations from S propagating information to V1 and do push at V1 propagating information to V2 and do push at V2 propagating information to source node. In this case, the ratio of the source node is increased again. So it means that we need to do the push operation starting from the source node again. However, we think that this loop at the source node could be cut down. We only need to perform the push operation at the source node once. To expand this, we show the two cases here. The first case is the initial residue of the source node is still is one. And here is the result after pushing the information from the source node for the first time. And here, the second case, the initial residue of node S is 0 0.512. And here is the result of doing the push operation from the source node for one time. We could see that the result in the first case over the second case is proportional. For example, the residue in the first case over the residue of the source node in the second case is equal to the ratio of one of two initial residues, one over 0 0.512. Similar results could be found in other methods. All of them have the same ratio of one over 0 0.512. It means that we could update the ratio of reserve in the second case by using the results in the first case in constant time. So in here, we have known that the effect of pushing another 0 0.512 information from the source node. So we can update the reserve and ratio by using the ratio 1 over 0 0.512. So we can update the results by using the ratio and update the ratio of source node. And similarly, we could down for other nodes. Here is the overview of our method. It has three phases, H hope forward, one more forward, and the random word sampling. Here node S is the source node, and the initial ratio to the node S is one. The first phase is done in a subgraph highlighted by the yellow. It, this subgraph containing all the nodes whose shortest distance from the source node is at most h. In this graph, w1, w2, w3 are nodes in this graph. In this phase, it has two constraints. The first one is the source node s perform only one push operation at the beginning. And the second is only the nodes in the subgraph except the source node could perform the push operations. Here shows the process of this phase. Until the residue of the source node could not be updated again, we use the cutting loop technique to update the reserve and residue in the subgraph. Next, after this phase, some nodes accumulate their residues. They are highlighted in green. They could not perform any push operation in the first phase. So in the second phase, we let the green nodes perform the push operation further. Here shows the process of this phase. And after this phase, some nodes in the graph have very small residues. So we do random word sampling from those nodes, generating the random words from nodes V to hit the T. Our experiments use six real data sets and we set the termination probability alpha to be 0 0.2, and we select 50 source nodes for evaluations. This table shows the average query time for index-free methods. Here, follow-up is the most inefficient existing index-free method. From this table, we could see that our method is faster than follow by nearly four times. And here we show the accuracies. 
the axis x axis k is means the k's largest other real score with respect to the source node, and the y axis is the absolute error. The result of our method is highlighted in the black figure. We could see that our method could achieve higher accuracies than four by up to four orders of magnitude in all datasets. Our conclusion is we propose an index free algorithm. It's faster than baseline algorithm, and the result has higher accuracies than the baseline algorithms. Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, thanks, then then. I think there's a question for then then from Molly. Uh, the question is, uh, what's the difference between sim rank and the random walk with restart? The random walk can also be used to compute the sim rank score. Uh, then then, are you available to answer the question? Uh, yeah, here. Oh, uh, yeah, a good question. So. Actually, sim rank and the random work with restart all can compute the similarity score between two nodes in a graph. And for uh, sim rank is measured to to be the probability that two nodes will be meet. Uh, how to say? It? Mm, actually, uh, let, let me show this uh, uh, from the beginning. And random work with restart is measure the random work, random work with restart score of between two nodes as the probability like a random work starting from the source node will stop at a target node. And sim rank is based on another definition. It means that for a given source node and a target node T, they will measure two random works. One is starting from the source node S, another one is starting from the target node T, and it will measure the similarity score between S and T as the probability like these two random works first meet in the same steps. It means that uh, their definition is totally different. And according to many studies, sim, uh, sim, rank, ha, ha, sim rank achieves worse uh, performance in a reality, uh, real world applications than the world with restart because his definition is much more narrowed. And if you want, if you are curious about this, you can read a lot of uh, uh, survey papers about the same rank and the PP personalized page rank or the world with restart. That's all. Okay, thank you. Um, and also, before we switch to the next talk, uh, we have uh, actually, initially we had a question for uh, Yuko and uh, the question was, uh, previous works such as subgraph isomorphism have also addressed the pattern graph matching problem. Could you tell, uh, tell us the difference between them? Um, the answer uh, from Yuko, since she, has, she is having audio issues, I'm gonna read her answer. The answer is uh, most previous works perform edge to edge mappings, which are somewhat too strict for team formation. In our paper, we construct an index CCI to support edge to path uh, mappings. Second, they aim to return the entire matching subgraphs, which is very time consuming. Our goal is to find team members, but not the subgraphs containing the members. Uh, the second question of Ning Xing Sui was, Intuitively, using the MST only could already remove the redundant edges. Why are both CPG normalization and MST gener generation needed? And the answer from Yuko is, uh, if without CPG normalization, we cannot tell whether a removed edge is a redundant edge or a non-tree edge, then all the removed edges will be viewed as a non-tree edges, resulting in higher cost of the sub subsequent node matching. So both of the steps are necessary. Uh, so these are the questions and answers from uh, Ning Ning and the answers from Yuko. Thank you for the question as well as the answer. Um, for the next talk, uh, it is from Jeng Jung Yung Lee, 578. 
The title of the presentation, the title of the paper is Optimization of GPU-Based Sparse Matrix Multiplication for Large Sparse Networks. Uh, Zheng Yun is a master's student in the Department of Computer Science at Hang Yang University. Uh, he's working on graph analysis of various N SNS applications on GPU architectures. Uh, I'm assuming he's also online. So after the presentation, we can get some questions. Uh, we can continue, Harsha. Yang Li from Hanning University. Today, I will present our optimization technique of sparse matrix multiplications on GPU. Recently, large-scale data are collected from various networks and they are used for different purposes. For example, the large collected data can be used to social network analysis, physics simulations, and customized marketing. General characteristics of these network data are very large and sparse and they are usually represented by a form of a matrix. Therefore, it is important to manage these matrices as well. For the matrix representation, we don't use the typical two-dimensional dense array because the data are large sparse matrices. For the dense array format, if the data is n by n matrix, we need huge n square of ma the memory spaces, even though most of the elements are zero. So to save the memory spaces, we use compressed sparse format consists of a pointer, an index, and a value array. By using compressed sparse format, we can save memory spaces. Based on the sparse matrix format data, we can now get useful information from them. Then how can we do that? Matrix multiplication is, is an important operation to get the information from many applications. The characteristics of this operation is that all elements are computed in the same way and there are no dependencies and therefore it can be computed in parallel. For parallel applications, GPU is an appropriate accelerator, and therefore we use GPU as a target architecture. This figure shows a simple GPU architecture. GPU has its own memory hierarchy and multiple processor called streaming multiprocessor, shortly SM. And inside the SM, there are many small cores called streaming processor to execute each threads. Then how does it work? When the kernel is offloaded from the host, thread blocks, are, which are the groups of threads, is assigned to SMs. Then threads in a block are executed using the small cores concurrently in lockstep. If the kernel has not enough workloads, the GPU resources will be underutilized. On the other hand, if the kernel requires too much resources, memory contention occurs. So to take advantage of GPU, it is important to fully utilize the dedicated resources. When performing sparse matrix multiplication on GPUs, row-wise product method is widely used. Here is a, an example of row product-based multiplication. Following the row-wise product equation, the element A00 is column zero multiplies by row B0 star. A01 multiplies by B1 star, and A03 multiplies by B3 star. This is a single row-wise product operation and will be executed using multiple threads. As a result of single row-wise product, a single row of C is computed. In the same way, all the remaining rows are computed. Inside each row, there are some elements with the same column index, and these elements should be aggregated. Therefore, we need an additional step to merge these elements, and after the merge process, we finally get the result matrix C. We call the first step to generate all elements as an expansion, and the second step as a merge. As you can see, workloads between threads are different. And this can be a serious problem in GPUs. So we'll find another option. The another option is an outer product based multiplication. Following the outer product equation, the all elements on column zero are multiplied by the same row B0 star. 
by a single outer product operation, C0 is generated. Rest of the operation produces C1, C2, C3, and we can get the intermediate result C hat. And as in row wise product, we go through the merge process and generate the result matrix C. As you can see, every thread has the same workload, not having the thread level load imbalance problem of row product based multiplication. Then are all problems are solved? Actually, it's not. Here are the challenges when performing outer product based multiplication. First, in outer product, all elements in column A are multiplied by the same row of B. Therefore, if both row and column have too many non-zero elements, the resulting workload is often too large. If this workload creates a thread block and the block is executed in SM, it will take too much time compared to other workloads. Then other SMs need to wait the long dragging SM execution and stay idle. Therefore, if too many elements exist in a specific row or column, it will lead to severe performance degradation. The second problem is that some matrices are large, but too sparse and have only few elements in most of the rows and columns. For example, as shown in the graph, 95% of the rows in the location matrix have less than 32 non-zero elements. In GPUs, at least 32 parallel workload must be executed to guarantee the TLP parallels. So for the example matrix, most of the threads would be in idle state, waiting the running thread with the actual work. This can also cause for resource utilization while using the GPU. Therefore, the sparsity of the matrices can be Another challenge when performing the sparse matrix multiplication. The last problem is that the cost, cost of merge process is too high. The graph on the right side shows the execution time ratios of expansion and merge phase over the total execution time. As you can see, the portion of merge phase exceeds 50% of the total execution time in average. This is because the intermediate matrix C had is much denser than the input matrices and has too many non-zero elements. Even though we can admit that the merge process takes more time than the expansion, the merge process on GPUs is often too slow than expected. This is because GPUs generally allocate maximum number of thread blocks to SMs, but it often incurs high memory pressure. Therefore, the memory contention should be considered when using the GPU. In summary, we found three main problems of outer product based sparse matrix multiplication. First, the overloaded blocks cause poor SN level load balancing. Second, two sparse matrices cause non effective threads. Third, high resource contention during the merge phase degrades the overall performance. To solve the problem, we propose three high-level solutions to split the overloaded blocks to redistribute the workload evenly, and to gather the underloaded blocks to improve the TLP, and to limit the number of blocks in SM to alleviate memory contention. This is the simplified overview of our proposed block reorganizer. First, we scan the input matrices and classify the workloads of overloaded block and underloaded blocks. Then the overloaded blocks are split through the block splitting and the underloaded blocks are gathered through the block gathering. After that, we go through the merge process by considering, considering memory pressure through the block limiting and get the final result matrix C. Before applying three proposed techniques, we first need to know which column and row pair will generate an overloaded or uh, underloaded block. So we compute each block's workload and classify blocks based on predefined thresholds. We also compute the number of non-zero elements in each row of C hat to identify the blocks to cause the high L2 cache contention. 
Based on the classification result, we identified the column row pairs to create overloaded blocks. For the pairs, we perform block splitting by simply splitting the column into multiple small column vectors. This process can be easily performed by simply modifying the column pointers of the SC format. After the splitting, split vectors are will be multiplied by the row of B. As a result, we can divide a single huge outer product operation to three smaller operations, and they will be allocated into different SMs. As we discussed before, underloaded blocks with less than 32 effective threads can't fully utilize the resources. To solve the problem, we perform block gathering process. First, we scan matrix B to find the underloaded blocks and generate gathered blocks by combining multiple small blocks into some bigger unified blocks. For example, small blocks of thread block 0, 1, 3, 5 are gathered into a, small, uh, into a single large gathered block. As a result, in this example, small blocks with different number of effective threads are gathered and created three gathered blocks. After generating the matrix C hat, we perform a GPU architecture specific technique named block limiting to enhance the performance of merging process. As discussed, the merging process is a highly memory intensive operation. And if multiple highly memory intensive blocks are allocated into a same SM, the performance can be highly degraded due to the memory contention. Therefore, for blocks causing the contention, we limit the number of co-running blocks in a SM by applying block limiting, which is to increase the shared memory allocation size. By doing this, the total active number of blocks decrease and memory contention can be, can be alleviated. This is a detailed overview of block reorganizer. Now let me move to the evaluation. We evaluated block reorganizer on three different NVIDIA GPUs and compared it to four well-known libraries. We used real world data sets from Florida Matrix Collection and Stanford Large Network Dataset Collection. Most matrices from the Florida Collection are regular distributed matrices, and most matrices from Stanford Collection are skewed matrices. We also use synthetic data to further evaluate our method. The graph shows the related performance of various techniques normalized to our row product based multiplication baseline. Here, Block Reorganizer shows the best performance on most data sets and achieved 1.43 average performance gain over the baseline. To show the benefits of each proposed technique, we tested three techniques separately. For Florida matrix collection data set, which are mostly regular matrices, block gathering showed the uh, best performance gain. And for the skewed matrices from Stanford collection, block limiting and splitting showed good performance gain as expected. To show the general applicability of our method, we tested the effectiveness using synthetic data sets. In the experiments, we changed three different factors, the size, skewness, and the sparsity. In summary, this graph shows that if the matrix gets larger and skewed and sparser, block reorganizer shows the effectiveness and shows that our technique is good for large social network data. In conclusion, there are challenges while performing outer product-based parse matrix multiplication. To solve these challenges, we proposed the block reorganizer. By applying block reorganizer, we achieved 1.43 of performance gain over the baseline. Thank you.
Are there any questions? Thank you, Jung Yoon. Um, is there any question from the participants? Um, okay, our next talk is from King Liu. The title of the paper is VAC, Vertex Centric Attributed Community Search. Uh, King Liu is a postdoctoral student in the Department of Computer Science, Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, he's working on social graph analysis, spatial databases and database usability topics. Uh, feel free to copy paste if you have any questions. Uh, you can also have any question for the previous uh, presenters as well. We can resume the last talk, which is paper five. Hong Kong Baptist University. Yeah. I will introduce our work that is vertex centric attributed community search. I will introduce our work from the following six aspects. Communities are ubiquitous in the graph. Community search aims to find the densely connected graph containing the query set. It can help users find the personalized communities. Many models have been used for the community search, such as KCOS, KCHOP, and CLICK. In real applications, vertices in the graph are usually associated with some attributes, such as the location attributes, the texture attributes. Combining these attributes can help users find more meaningful communities. For example, for the network in this figure, if we only consider the friendship and the typicality as query vertex, we can find a community that consists of six members. If we take the locations into consideration, we can find that Paul is excluded from the community, since he is far away from the other members in the community. Many works have been studied the attributed community search, but existing work suffer from two limitations. First, existing works usually require users to specify the query attributes. However, it's not an easy task to specify the appropriate query attributes. Second, existing works are not flexible. In particular, these works support only a single kind of attribute. To make up for these deficiencies, we explore a novel problem called vertex centric attributed community search, and we call it the back problem for short. Next, I will into present the problem formulation for the communities in the attributed graphs. It should consider both the structure and attribute cohesiveness. For the structure cohesiveness, we employ the k chart model since it can find the community having strong cohesiveness while achieving high efficiency. In particular, a connected k chart is a connected graph such that every edge is within k minus two triangles. In addition, the maximal k chart is the k chart that such that there exists no other k charts that contains it. We show an example for the key chart. In the network, both H1 and H2 are four charges. In addition, the H2 is the maximum four charge. As for the attribute score, we employ distance metric to compute it. Since it satisfies the triangle inequality, first we present the Attribute score for the two vertices. For the different attributes, we can employ different distance metrics to compute. To compute, for example, 
for the geolocation attribute, you can use the Euclidean distance. And for the texture attribute, you can use the Jacquard distance. Based on the attribute score of two vertices, the attribute score of the graph is defined as the maximum attribute score of two vertices in the graph. Then we formally define the set problem as follows. Given an attribute graph, a query set, and a parameter k, the problem is to find a subgraph stage satisfying the following four properties. First, the H should contain the query set. Second, the H should be a connected key class. Third, the H should have the smallest attribute score. And finally, the H should be the maximum. Next, I analyze the problem from two aspects. First, the VEC problem is NP hub. We can prove it by reducing a well known NP hub problem that is the maximum click to the VEC problem. Second, is the about free rider effect. The free rider effect is an undesirable phenomenon for the community search. That is, some cohesive structure but irrelevant to the query vertices could be included in the community answer. We can show that the back problem can avoid the free rider effect. The detailed proofs are needed here due to the time limitations. In order to effectively handle the back problem, we propose both exact and approximate algorithm. The straightforward way to tackle the back problem is to first enumerate all the key classes and then return the maximum key class with the smallest attribute score. But this method is insufficient since the enumeration process is very expensive. In particular, the enumeration process can be reported as a binary search tree. We find that the whole tree has many unnecessary subgraphs as invisible answers. For example, the, for the root node M1, its right branch is to delete the vertex, query vertex Q. However, the query vertex should be contained in the community. And the right branch of N1 cannot be contributed to the final row and can be pruned safely. Based on this observation, we have that if we can prune the unqualified binary search chain node as soon as early as possible, the efficiency of the error code, the efficiency of the algorithm can be improved. Based on this, Motivated by this observation, we propose our first algorithm by traversing the binary search tree in the best first manner, during which we propose three heuristics to prune the searching space. First, in particular, the add branch rules and the delete branch rules are used to prune the unqualified branch and the selection and the vertex selection order is used to select the vertex that can yield small binary search tree. Our second algorithm is based on the best first search. First, we present an important observation. In the figure, we list Three three classes that is T1, T2, and T3. The T1 has the largest attribute score. We can find that T2 and T3 cannot contain both V3 and V4, which have the largest attribute score. This otherwise the T2 and the T4 will have will have the same attribute score as T1. 
Through this observation, we have that to find the key terms with small attribute score, we must split the relationship of vertices that have the maximum attribute score. Otherwise, the attribute score won't decrease. This motivated by this observation, we propose our second algorithm. Its basic idea is as follows. It first finds the vertex pair that have the maximum attribute score, and then the algorithm splits the candidate key charts into two smaller key charts by deleting the vertices respectively. In this step, we propose a strategy to prune the key charts. In particular, the charts H I and H D. If the H I is a subgraph of H D, H I can be simply pruned. Then the algorithm process. The algorithm continues the spread until there is no key chart. We use an example to explain our second algorithm. First, we find the vertex pair that has the maximum maximum attribute score. That is the vertex three and the vertex four. Then we delete these two vertices respectively and get two smaller key classes. We find that the left key chart is the subgraph of the right one. Hence, the left subgraph is pruned. We continue to process the right key chart. In the same way, we first find the vertex pair that has the maximum attribute score. That is the V2 and V4. Then we delete these two vertices respectively. And get a smaller what is uh, get a smaller key chart that consists by Q V1 and V2. And this key chart cannot be deleted, cannot delete anymore. So it's the final result. Next we introduce our approximate algorithm. First we introduce the query attribute score. Which is defined as the maximum attribute score between the vertex V and all the query vertex. Based on the query attribute score, the basic idea of approximate algorithm is that we first compute the maximum k chart and then it deletes the vertices with the, with the largest query attribute score. And the mean while maintains the remaining graph as a key chart. The algorithm repeated repeats the second step until no key chart exists. And uh, finally, the last key chart is the final result. We also use an example to, illust to illustrate the approximate algorithm. First, we find the good text that has the largest query attribute score, that is the vertex 4. And then we delete the vertex 4 and its incident edge. Then we maintain the remaining subgraph as key chunks by deleting the DC and its edge. Then the remainder key chunks cannot be deleted anymore, and it's the final result which is the same as the result of our second algorithm. Next, we conduct experiments to evaluate our proposed algorithm. We employ six data sets in our experiment, in which the Facebook contains the ground, ground truth community. In addition, we Evaluate three parameters, including the cardinality of the query set, the parameter k, and the cardinality of the graph. We first evaluate the proposed model based on the ground truth community. To this end, we employ six algorithms, including the exact and approximate algorithm of 
problem based on the K-trust model and the K-core model. In addition, we also employed another two K-trust based community search algorithms. As for the metrics, we employ precision community structure similarity and uh, community attribute similarity. Through the results, we can find that the model of back problem based on the K-trust model can find the community that are more similar to the ground choose communities, and it is the most effective. Then we evaluate the efficiency of our proposed algorithms. In this experiment, we use the running time, the set of search space, and the space cost as our metrics. These are results, we can find that the approximate evidence has the best performance in terms of time, search space, and the space cost, and the depth first base algorithm has the worst performance. To conclude, we study a new attributed community search problem and propose sufficient algorithms to handle it. Finally, extensive experiments demonstrate the, eff the effectiveness and efficiency of our model and algorithm. Thank you. Okay, thank you, King Lee. Um, any questions for our last paper from King Lee? I don't see any questions in the chat window. Um, by the way, uh, I've seen Professor Tamer Ösu uh, among the participants uh, during our session. He pretty much joined all the uh, all of the talks. Uh, as you know, he's a world-renowned uh, professor and researcher in the world, uh, especially on database field. So it's uh, very good that uh, he joined our session as well. Um, if there is no other questions, I think we're pretty much on time. We have five minutes left. If there's no questions, I think we can close the session. Thanks everyone for joining and for these nice papers. Bye everyone. Bye, thank you.